welcome to Converging Dialogues. This is Xavier Benin. In this episode, I am very honored and privileged to have Jean Twangy on the podcast. Jean is the professor of psychology at San Diego State University and is the author of more than 180 scientific publications and books. Uh, she has her bachelor's and master's from the University of Chicago and her PhD from the University of Michigan. She is the author of a handful of books, uh, some such as The Narcissism Epidemic, uh, Living in the Age of Entitlement, which was co-authored with uh, W. Keith Campbell, Generation Me, iGen, and the new one, Generations, The Real Differences Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and Silence, and What They Mean for America's Future. I was really excited to talk with her about her research and in particular about this book, which is a a wonderful book. We start the conversation by defining what a generation is and why that's important. Why is it important to study generations? We talk about uh, her main thesis, which is that technology is central to generational changes. We talk about some of the ranges for generations. Many people get, you know, worked up on uh, where does it start and stop and you know, there is a type of range, but she talks a little bit about, you know, why those ranges are, are important. We had the decision to use this conversation um, in a way that was current. And so we decided to work backwards instead of starting with silence. So uh, as we talk about in the conversation, uh, there's not many folks living from the greatest generation anymore. And as she mentions the, the data there, is pretty thin. Um, and so she starts with silence. So it was one of the first of the six currently living in the U S but we decided to start with, uh, the newest, she calls them polar. Some people call them alphas. Um, they're current. So there's not a lot of data on them, uh, either. Um, so, so then we, we talk about some of the upcoming trends for the, the current generation. Um, or the newest generation, and then we we talk by uh, about Gen Z and Gen Z and millennials, which are the two longest chapters in our books. There's a lot of data on on those generations. We talk about some of the major themes for Gen Z, and we spend a good amount of time talking about uh, social media and mental health. This is something that she's written a lot about. This is stuff that she's talked about, um, and it was really really wonderful to uh, engage with her. Uh, on the data, um, some of the constructive criticism that's out there on, on some of this data. And so it was, it was absolutely wonderful. We talk about some of the uh, increase in folks that identify as trans or non-binary for uh, young people, so Gen Z, and um, kind of talk about the data and, and what that could be about. We talk about millennials. Um, are they really as narcissistic and self-absorbed as many people have thought? We talk about millennials uh, being more educated and not as broke as many people thought, something she mentions in her book. We talk about um, some of the changed social and family dynamics with millennials. We talk about Gen X. Uh, Gen X is the middle child of generations and some of their emphasis on uh, toughness. This is an idea that we uh, talk about, that she talks about in her book and we talk about that comes, I believe, from Megan Dom's conceptualization. as we mentioned in the conversation, Megan's great. And uh, it was really, really nice to talk about some of those ideas as well. We talk about some of the erosion of trust with institutions that kind of starts with boomers and just continues to increase uh, with each uh, subsequent generation. Uh, we talk about boomers and how they've been kind of central throughout their lives. That's what she mentions in the book. It's really fascinating. Uh, some of the deaths of despair of sorts for for boomers and some of the the unique challenges that they've had. And then we talk about the bipartisan nature of the silent generation, Um, really kind of the one of the last few generations that have that emphasis. And then we talk about uh, future generations. I mean, you know, where, where are we going? Where are we headed? Are generations going to keep getting smaller and smaller as things, you know, change in the world. And so um, it was, it was absolutely uh, fascinating talking with with Jean. Um, I, I really, really was looking forward to the conversation. It definitely didn't disappoint. Uh, I think generations are something that are, uh, at the very least, nominally interesting for most people in, in talking about uh, differences culturally and socially. And 
and um, you know how we all we all live together. You know, all these generations are living together at one time, and uh, the impact that uh, we have on each other it's uh, it's super important. Uh, as always, you can find this conversation and all other conversations at my free Substack, which is conversiondialogues.substack.com. Uh, head over there, follow, subscribe, share, do all the all the things. Um, that's much appreciated. And uh, now I bring you Gene Twain. I'm here with Gene Twain. Gene, uh, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast. I'm uh, looking forward to this. Yeah, me too. Yeah, so you've uh, obviously you've you've done a lot of research uh, on many uh, topics in terms of uh, social media and digital media and with generations, and you have a new book coming out. Uh, the new book is called Generations, The Real Differences Between Gen Z, Millennials, Gen X, Boomers, and Silence, and What They Mean for America's Future. Uh, it's a fantastic book. Before we get into it, uh, could you just tell folks um, who you are, what your background's in, and what you're currently up to? Yeah. So I am a personality and social psychologist by training. Um, my graduate training was in personality psychology at University of Michigan, and then I did a postdoc in experimental social psychology at Case Western um, with Roy Baumeister. So I kind of have a foot in you know both both camps there. Um, but the research on generations is what I have been doing since grad school, ever since um, actually really as an undergrad, uh, I started to to read a lot of stuff on my own generation, Gen X, um, and thought it could be more empirically based. Mm. Yeah, uh, I mean, I know you've I know you've written a few things. Uh, I know is iGen. I, I, I've read this one. You have uh, the the other one you wrote with Keith Campbell. Uh, so you've you've done some other ones, but this book I was really looking forward to because I know you've you've written some obviously papers on it, and I've read a lot of things on it. And uh, the book is, I mean, at least in edition is is quite uh, unassuming. It's it's over five hundred pages, and it doesn't look that that long, but uh, it reads great though. I mean, it, it's oh, good. It's, Thank it's, you. It's, it's it's a lot of data, which is wonderful, though. I mean, you're you're a good writer, and and so it's it's really really explained well, and you outline it well, and so it's uh it's great. I, I highly recommend it. So, okay, so you, you the premise of the book is that we have six living generations in our society. You don't include the greatest, which I guess they're all hundred years old or late nineties now. Yeah. So, which is wild because when I was growing up. Uh, they were still around, uh, as I'm sure for you as well, obviously. So um, I guess, how do we, let's start by defining generation uh, and why that's important. I think some people may say that's kind of arbitrary or something, but why is studying a generation and then these six generations uh, important for understanding our culture and society now? Yeah. yeah, so the word generation originally meant, you know, generations in the same family, but the way that we often use it now and the way I use it in the book is social generations, people who experience certain things, especially during childhood and adolescence, and then how that shapes their worldview, how it shapes their behavior, their personality, and so on. Um, and it, 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 what the book is about really is how, when you're born affects your whole life and so many things, um, and not just about events you experience because those have impacts, but other than things like the COVID-19 pandemic, right? mm -hmm. those impacts tend not to really affect day-to-day -day life that much. You know, what affects day-to-day -day life is things like technology, mm -hmm. um, things like changes in individualistic values, um, how quickly or slowly you grow up in terms of you know, the developmental trajectory. Like, did you get your driver's license at 16 or was that something you weren't really interested in until later? That's a big, a big generational difference. And there's really big and substantial differences between the generations, you know, on, you know, all of these things. And it leads to a lot of misunderstanding. And that's one of the main reasons I wanted to study this is, Let's throw a ton of data at these questions and try to see what the real differences are and how we can understand each other better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think I think it is important to understand dynamics that people have between each other. I'll come to that in a minute with each generation. I guess one question I have here is: in we'll talk about technology, obviously, but 
What would you say about different cohorts where in different centuries past, now granted, this is getting a little bit further from the data, but maybe more conceptually, where technology, I guess, was more stable. So in an agricultural society or in a maybe even industrial, pre-industrial, industrial society where there wasn't a lot of technology, would we just see generations be much uh, longer than they are now? Or what happens when you have generations that collapse into kind of one? Is there, is there really a difference? Yeah. So I, I, you know, and I mostly am thinking about generations born in the, the 20th century, 21st century, yeah. where we, you know, have had some, some data to think about it. But even there, you can see with the acceleration of technology that although the, the you know, the generational cutoffs are somewhat arbitrary, it looks like things are changing faster. I think most people would agree with that, that the technological change uh, in the last 20 years, just has been so enormous compared to, say, the technological change between 1920 and 1940, mm-hmm. say. So that means generation seems to have speeded up. And sure enough, by the groupings that are often used, the more recent generations like Gen Z and millennials are only about 15 years long. Mm-hmm. And for the boomers, it's longer. And the silent generation is... 21 years. So it it's sped up. And I think that I think that is not a coincidence. And it's it's a it's a product of um that that change accelerating. Mm. So you talk about some of these generational differences and you talk about technology as a kind of through line in all of these generations. Again, the the six that you mentioned in the book, uh, the 20 and 21st centuries. So I guess why technology is is do you see as the underlying theme? Obviously, we can get to this later. A variety of, of variables that are implicated, but why do you see technology as kind of central? Um, and, and what are other major event changes that could be implicated? Uh, for example, you you say that technology is seen through individualism, slower life, and major events. So, kind of just yeah. talk us through why you centralize technology in these kind of three aspects. Yeah. So the traditional way to think about generations is to think about you know major events in history and then say, well, how old was this generation when this happened? But I think where that falls apart is that a, a lot of events don't really affect day-to-day life. And they may or may not you know, change people's values or behaviors you know, in any significant way. But what has had an absolutely enormous impact on how we live our lives is technology. So um, I sometimes think about it this way, maybe particularly being female, that if I had been born in 1871 instead of 1971, my life would be completely different, mm-hmm. completely yeah. different yeah. Uh, and see, like every single way. Um, I, and then I think about even like a small example. My favorite example is laundry. Laundry used to be something that groups of women had to do all together, and it would take the entire day because you would have to build a fire and boil water over an iron pot, and you would use you know these homemade soaps, and their hands would get all chapped and so on. And yeah, it would take the whole day, you know, ten hours, twelve hours. And now everybody knows how we do laundry. Now you throw it in the washer, and you go relax, Mm -hmm. and then you move it to the dryer, and then you go relax some more. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's technology too. These labor-saving devices. It's incredible. Um, and medical technology that we also live longer lives. Uh, and then, of course, what we often think of technology, social media, computers, smartphones, you know, all, all of these things. Um, and it just had such an enormous impact uh, you know, on, on our day-to-day lives. So that's its direct impact. Then there's these downstream effects mm-hmm. like increasing individualism. So that's something I've written about for for decades, and then so have many others, that um, cultures have become increasingly more individualistic in their orientation, more focus on the self, less focus on others. Mm-hmm. And that's possible because of technology. Mm-hmm. It, it was pretty almost impossible to be a true individualist in you know the, the late 1800s. You had to depend much more on other people. It was really hard to live alone. So very few people did live alone because mere survival of the household took everybody working together. And now, of course, with washing machines and grocery stores and all these things, it's not as necessary. So we can have more, more self-focus. And then the other piece is with medical technology leading to longer lives, and leading to the necessity for more education, because technological society is more complex, you need to learn more before you can participate in the economy. That leads to um, the you know, great um, 
you know, framework of the slow versus fast life strategy. You get a slower life strategy with, with more technology. Parents tend to have fewer children and nurture them more carefully. And the entire developmental trajectory slows down from infancy to old age. Mm. The kids are less independent. Adolescents are less likely to have the driver's license or drink alcohol or date. Young adults take longer to get married and have children uh, and settle into a career. And then at older ages, you get 50 is the new 40 mm -hmm. and 70 is the new 60 right. and, and, you know, longer retirements, and like all, all of these things. Um, and so, and all of those are rooted in technological progress. Yeah. I, I think your, your, your claim is obviously very, very relevant and accurate to how we understand life now, but I, it's nice how you're bringing up these examples of you know, things from, yes, turn of the century, 20, 20th century uh, into the early 20th century, where once we had these technological changes, uh, it was instrumental and impactful for for people's lives in, in big ways. Um, so, so let's talk about these ranges for generations. When I, when I talk with folks about, you know, generational differences, if you will, different generations, um, people always usually like to talk about it. They, they, they find it very interesting. Yeah. I, and uh, I mean, I do as well. And so it's, it is interesting. So first, there's <laughs> you claim in the book, and 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 I think that's right. But there's these the cutoffs are kind of arbitrary, right? So uh, I'm kind of a middle millennial, right? I'm born in the in the mid ish '80s, and so you know I kind of see it as like millennials are 1980 to 94, right? So you know the millennials ahead of me by five or six years. You know, I kind of see them as a little bit different, but the the people kind of in that middle space, and then I don't really, I don't know, say associate, but I don't really. It, my upbringing or my life is different from people that were born in ninety three or ninety four or ninety two, even right. You know, when you're talking about five six years, so do you find that this happened? I mean, you could do the same thing with Gen X. You could do the same. I mean, you know, people born in nineteen sixty six, nineteen sixty seven. It'd be a little bit different than 1978 or 79. Just so, how do we get to these ranges? What's the kind of mm, kind of interval, if you will, for like, yeah, rougher? You know, it's kind of give or take this range. And and how do we choose, you know, the generational uh, kind of frameworks? Yeah, these are all you know absolutely true. All all good points. The cutoffs are rel relatively arbitrary in in, in many cases. And there is lots of variation, you know, between those born say at the beginning and the end. And it sometimes is, yeah, it's a linear, it's a linear change. So that's one reason why most of the graphs in the book show the lines by year. So then you can see that, yeah, there was change from the beginning of the millennials to the end or the beginning of boomers to the end. Absolutely. Um, it's someone who was born in 1980 does have a different experience from someone born in 1994. Very true. Yeah. But what I think people often miss in this discussion is that generations are very similar to other groups that we study who we also have to find arbitrary cutoffs for. So age is a great example. And we talk about adolescents and children um, and people in their people in their twenties is actually probably the best. You know, okay, well, I'm going to study people from ages 20 to, to 29. Well, 20 year olds is pretty different from a 29 year old. Yes, but when we do research, we have to group people. Yeah, because otherwise we don't get sample size. Right. And then we got all kinds of weird stuff going on for trying to look at individual cohorts. In this mm -hmm. case, or people born you know, or or by age, you know, 20. We're going to look at people who are 20, 21. It's just it ends up being a mess. So you have to you have to draw the line somewhere, and it's just it's just a it's a way to do research. It's a way to talk about the differences um, in a way that's just more manageable. Do you find you talk about in this in this bit? This is towards the introduction about um, kind of major cultural norms as being really important, um, and how people can feel or not feel a part of their generation. But it's really the major cultural norm. So, for example, you know, there's going to be a generation where the pandemic is really, you know, kind of central for their lives, right? It's central for everyone's lives, but is there you know, kind of going through development? Or for some folks, um, probably somewhere in my age bracket, 
uh, 9-11 was the watershed moment, you know, or et cetera. And the moon landing, you know, whatever it is, there's these big major things. I guess how, so even if people, I don't feel like a millennial sometimes, sometimes I, I guess I am, I, I don't know, but there's sometimes where um, people can feel or not feel part of it, but you emphasize that it's really the major cultural norms. So what is that about, I guess? Yeah. So, I mean, th- just, I mean, think about some of the things that really distinguish, say, millennials from other generations. So that, um, for example, that they married later, and that's a trend that's been going on for a while. You know, boomers married later than silence, Gen Xers married later than boomers. This has been going, this is the slow life strategy. Yeah. And then other things like 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 values around individualism. You know, how much are you going to focus on on the self? Uh, and those those things just, you know, especially when you think about individualism and, and the, the impacts that it ends up having in terms of equality. Of that's what individualism is. It says, you know, we're going to say you will have the same opportunities regardless of your background. And we're going to tr- do what we can to um, get rid of discrimination based on race and ethnicity and gender and, and sexual orientation. That has a huge impact on, on people's lives. Yeah. Um, and I, I would argue more, uh, more of an impact on the average person's life than almost any major event. You know, with a few exceptions, sure. the the two big exceptions um, in the last hundred years, well, in the last eighty years or so, World War II and the COVID nineteen pandemic. Mm. But you know, those are also things that happened over a few year period, and then with you know some adjustments here and there, life returned to quote normal. So you think about, you know, again, it's really, it's really these other things that year after year, day to day, have a much bigger impact on how people live, and what their belief systems are, and on on all of those things. Yeah, no, that's that's that's, that's very very important. So we've kind of set the stage here in terms of generations. You know what they are, how we measure them, what the cutoffs are. You know, roughly. Um, and so I, I mean, again, as you say in the book is that, you know, obviously this is not everybody born between these ages. There's obviously going to be differences, you know, et cetera, but these are kind of in the aggregate. So I think, um, we were talking before we started, I think it makes sense to kind of start backwards, um, because we have so much data as you detail in the book about Gen Z's and millennials, <clears throat> uh, in particular, I'm not just for listeners, I'm not wanting to start there because I'm a millennial. That's not my reasoning for doing this. I actually really like Gen X uh, folks. I think they're one of the better generations. <laughs> Gen X are pretty cool. Um, but uh, and boomers, is, there's a lot of interesting stuff there. So let's just talk about, I guess, we could just spend a few minutes on this because there's not as much there. But so the current generation. So we just people have different names, I guess, but you call them polars. Some people call them alphas. Um, and this starts, this is the current generation that we have. So 2013 ish mm-hmm. until 2029. Um, there's still a lot to, 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 a lot of these are, um, I guess, what is there? 10, 10, zero to 10 years old at the moment. So, you know, we're, we're not, exactly. not quite there, but they're the current generation. What do you, what do you think about the current generation as they're kind of blossoming, if you will, as they're kind of developing into this world, why did you pick the name Polars um, or why do people use Alpha, I guess? And um, what do you, I guess you're some of your um, uh, early themes that we're seeing from this current generation. Yeah. So I call them Polars after melting polar ice caps and political polarization. So two things, you know, that are big and will have a big impact on this generation going mm-hmm. forward. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know these were the kindergartners of the pandemic. Yeah. But I don't. I don't think that necessarily has to doom them. Um, the silent generation, who we'll talk about later, were the product of you know being very young during the Great Depression and World War II. And they turned out to be a very resilient, um, impactful generation. I do. You know, I do think there are some troubling trends. 
with uh, children now, um, especially around exercise and obesity and, and screen time, some of the stuff that will come up, you know, with with uh, Gen Z and, you know, arguably all the generations. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but we don't have a ton of data yet. So there, you know, that's the shortest chapter of, you know, of the generations. Um, but that's that's what we do have data on. And it there, there are some concerning trends there that we, you know, need to, start thinking about kids playing outside um and not always being in front of a screen yeah i mean absolutely i mean i fully agree with you uh, on on that bit is there a reason why again this is loose 2029 or 2030 is there a reason yes just a guess yeah (laughs) Yeah. that's 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 a guess um i'm a little more confident of that um cutoff between gen z and and polars being 2012 2019 Uh partially based on the length of the generations but also based on um most polars will not remember a time before the COVID 19 pandemic and most gen z will Uh uh-huh yeah that makes sense yeah yeah so so let's talk about gen z i mean uh, gen z and, and millennials make up the longest uh chapters in the book uh, which was great because there's a lot of data. And, and so Gen Z's, um, my daughter is Gen Z. She's a, I guess she's a, she's kind of in the middle actually. So yeah, she's kind of somewhere in there. Uh, 95 to 2012. Uh, you can talk about that cutoff. I know some people say 97. Right. Some people say Yeah, Pew Research Center says 97. I have yeah. kept it at 95 because that, that's actually one of the cutoffs um, I'm a little more confident in because uh. there's some, you know, big differences that showed up that were much more sudden mm. between millennials and Gen Z. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I guess the, the biggest thing here, is, I mean, some of these things kind of piggyback off each other, but, you know, most people will, will kind of get it. But Gen Z is the first, should we say first generation born into a world of socialization online, right? And and you talk about many of the major themes being their concern for authenticity, free speech, gender norms, you know, put, you know, uh, pushing them in different ways, uh, and then mental health challenges. So how, how do we how do we get here with this constellation of issues for for this generation? Yeah. So um, one thing that really showed up right away was issues around mental health. Mm. So that's when I first you know, started to realize that there was that generational break between millennials and Gen Z um, sometime with the you know, burst in the, in the mid 90s, because around 2012 and the, you know, these big national um, data sets of, of teens that I work with, there were some really sudden changes. You know, more and more teens started to say they felt left out, that they felt lonely. Uh, that they couldn't do anything right, that they didn't enjoy life. And those, those last two are you know, classic symptoms of depression. Then it showed up in measures of uh, clinical level depression um, in a, in a government funded survey. Uh, it shows up in behaviors like emergency room admissions for self harm, suicide rates, you know, all, all of these things. It was very sudden, very large, and very, very consistent that around 2012, all these things started to get much, much worse. Mm-hmm. So, you know, a couple things here. That was long before the pandemic. So mm-hmm. there's been a lot of attention recently to the mental health crisis among adolescents, which is good. But I've also seen a lot a lot of um, assumption that that's due to the pandemic. And no, this started more than 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. So this is not just due to the pandemic. This is not a, a new problem. Clinical level depression among teens doubled between 2011 and 2019. So that's a big change in a short period of time yeah. when we didn't have a big disruptive event like the pandemic. In fact, we had good things going on. A lot of indicators for children and teens were improving over that time, like child abuse, um, I mean, I mean, car accidents, uh, kids getting in physical fights, alcohol use, all of that was getting better. It was going down, you know, at this time. The U.S. economy was improving over that time. That's when the U.S. economy did really well. Was that eight-year period? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's what was so puzzling is that all of these things are going right, and then you have the mental health going in exactly the wrong direction than what you'd want to see, uh, in particular for adolescents. So yeah, you, you mentioned this. You, you mentioned that 
there's four pieces of evidence with with Gen Z mental health. So you're you're, you're alluding in social in social media specifically. You talk the four pieces are timing, the impact on day to day life, group level effects, and the impact on girls uh, specifically. Yeah. Um, and and you you make sure it's clear. I mean, I could I could find the quote, but you say this is not all cases, and you and you um, but it's the excess cases, and you you state that yes. so it's it's not every single. Uh, a person, obviously, but could you just talk about those four pieces of evidence uh, that that you were able to to uncover? Yeah. So, given that we have so much else that was going right over this time, you have to say, okay, well, then what happened? You know, what happened around 2012 that might cause this? Well, that was the first time the majority of Americans owned a smartphone, and it was also around the time that social media use went from optional to mandatory. Because so like say 2009, about half of teens use social media every day. And then by 2017, it was about 85%. So it kind of had a tipping point in there, especially for a population like high school students. You know, if half of people are doing something and half aren't, kind of optional. Once it reaches arguably, you know, 75%, then you're left out if you don't do it. So that's when we see, say, the, 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 the group effects that it's not just that social media and smartphones were rising in use at the same time teen depression was going up which is very suspicious mm-hmm. it's also that even if you did even if you're a teen who didn't use social media or weren't on your phone that much who would you go out with when all your friends were at home on Instagram on a Saturday night this is, these are group level things not just individual things social media is social mm-hmm. so we have to think think about that general Generational um, effect as well. You know, the the other piece of it is just yeah, the effect on day to day life. That at the same time that these technologies were increasingly popular, teens also started spending a lot less time with each other face to face. They also started to spend a lot less time sleeping. You know, this is very obviously not a good formula for mental health. Yeah. So. Yeah, you know, there was a fundamental change in the way teens spent their time outside of school. So I guess here's my question here is obviously it's or not maybe not so obviously. So the, what's obvious is there's a market change socially and in groups. And now we can talk about some of the, the crit- criticisms here on this stuff, because there's some people that have said, well, I don't know about that. I mean, can we really blame it or can we really say how instrumental you know, social media or Instagram is, I mean, is that just a coincidence thing? So I, I guess for, for you, what's the kind of on, on your side of this, cause you're the one that's, you know, really close to the data on this. What is it that was so, okay. Yes. Timing increase, uh, group level, uh, involvement, but what was the thing that really just kind of drove this home of increased social media use, um, you know, smartphones, you know, whatever social media, but then and then teen depression, you know, self harm, self injured behaviors. What was the kind of big few things that were like, yes, I can, I can kind of hang my hat on this and say this was kind of the key factor here. Yeah. Well, one thing is really simple. Um, what else? What else had such a big impact on day to day life? Mm. Mm. And the answer is nothing. You know, and yes, there's uh, you can make ca- you can make alternative cases, and I, I completely agree it's important to consider you know alternative explanations. Mm-hmm. But I've been making this argument publicly, very publicly, for five and a half years, right, yeah. and I've yet to hear another explanation that fits the data as well, or mm-hmm. that had a, as big of effect on day to day life for teens. So, um. <laughs> So I, I guess so. I, I'm curious here because I, I, I've uh, I've been thinking about this and, and preparing for the conversation, and and I was wondering. I said, you know, I, I I definitely agree with your points. I was trying to find, you know, what's the kind of steel man version of the alternatives because I think it's obviously I think you would agree it's important to be fair to the data and, and to how we're seeing things. Is um, because I know people have said this before about mass media, right? You know, all you know, violent video games. You know, cause people to go shoot up schools, and that turns out that it was on shaky ground. It made sense for a while, but then kind of mass media violence and then actual violence, from what I understand, is maybe not as linear, kind of causal. I guess. Let me ask you this way: 
if we were to if we were to do a a big the biggest uh, logistic regression uh, kind of analysis here, uh, and I guess if we put it down into like kind of three categories: historical, uh, cultural, individual. What are those variables that you're plugging in? So obviously, technology, social media, et cetera. What other things that could we say are also impacting the rise in teen depression, anxiety, self-injurious behavior, uh, so on and so forth? Um, wh what other things could be impactful as well? What other variables? Yeah. So, I mean, a, a lot of the things people suggest just don't, don't line up, like school shootings. Mm -hmm. Well, if that were the case, that got started to get tons of attention in the late 90s. Yeah, but yeah. between the late 90s and 2011, there's very little change. And in some cases, even an improvement in teen mental health. But OK, you can take some stuff around that, especially, you know, like if it may be increasing popularity of lockdown drills. It might be, you know, that's that, that, that's not so great. But again, that's not every single day. You know, mm -hmm. it's it, it's different in, in, in its in its in its impact. Maybe that's in there. Well, one thing I think you can make a. a maybe a stronger case about maybe is the slow development potentially having some negative effects. And this is a tough one because the slow life strategy, so which we mentioned before. So for teens, what we're talking about is that they go out of the house less without their parents. Well, that overlaps with the technology and face-to-face -face interaction piece. But they also drink alcohol less. They're less likely to get their driver's license. Mm -hmm. They are less likely to go out on dates. Uh, they're less likely to have paid jobs, so they're they're taking longer to grow up. And what's a little harder to measure, but very plausible, is they're just dependent on their parents for longer. And that's kind of what's going on there. Is an eighteen year old is not as independent as they were in 1970. Um, they just haven't had as much experience making their own decisions, um, just being out in the world and being on their own. And you can make the argument that that's maybe maybe teens need that. They may need more of those experiences with independence to be mentally healthy. Mm. That's a little hard because those trends around slow life strategies, again, started longer ago. They didn't happen suddenly around 2011 or 2012, like some of the things around, around smartphones, or at least more suddenly. That those trends with with slow life, like the decline and getting the driver's license and drinking alcohol and all of these things, started more in the in the 90s. But you could make potentially like a tipping point argument, something like that. Mm. But it does all go together. You know, the the root of that slow life strategy is again technology writ large, not just smartphones. Mm -hmm. But I think that you can that has a has I think a little bit more heft behind it of saying that's something else that had a big impact on day to day life. And that when you think about adolescent development and what's important, having that independence and spending that time with friends without adults around is really crucial. Mm -hmm. And because they're doing less of that, mm -hmm. that that could be part of the problem too. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely see a lot of that. I guess that there's one question here I was thinking about and, and trying to look at this critically because, you know, I know I, I certainly have spent on the podcast with other people. I mean, I beat up social media like anybody else does, right? You know, I, I, I use it, but I, I beat up on it as well. So I was trying to do due diligence is now I know there's a lot of survey data, right? So so my world in, in clinical psych, it, are, are we seeing that the, the rise in depression rates is, is clinical depression and non-clinical depression? Yes. Is it, yeah, both okay, are so, going up. Okay, so this isn't yeah. just folks on you know Meta or Facebook, you know, kind of a data kind of place, and they're they're doing all of this types of uh, surveys and forums. But we're seeing clinical levels yeah. of depression yeah, from the from like the best data we have, like the National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Okay, okay, funded you know funded by Department of Health and Human Services, which and, and it's a screening study. It's important to know it's a screening study. It's not just people who are seeking help. Yeah, yeah, okay. So we know okay. it's not just help seeking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's important. Um. Because my thing was, what if adolescents, because of, of of a kind of generational drift, if you will, you know, every generation is a little bit more aware, or they're more willing to disclose or seek help. What if some of this stuff that's coming out, maybe in the non-clinical uh, data points, maybe we're just having a bigger picture of how difficult adolescence is, right? On top of 
you know, a lot of the cynicism. I mean, when Gen Zs look out into the world, it, it's pretty, I mean, it is, I mean, any generation could say this, but it's bleak in some ways, right? What are they going to do? And I, I, I challenge that. Is this really a worse time than boomers getting drafted into Vietnam? <laughs> That's fair. Is it a worse That's time fair. than millennials graduating from college during the Great Recession? Is mm-hmm. it a worse time than for Gen X when mm-hmm. I was in high school, for example, when we thought the world was going to end at any moment when Russia dropped the bomb? Right, 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 right. Yeah. So that's the thing. Every generation has their things. But I guess my point is, is are Gen Z's just better at talking about it? Or like, are they more like, it's less taboo? I I don't know. What do you think? Maybe. But if that was the reason, if that was the whole explanation for that increase in depressive symptoms and clinical level depression, what you'd expect is there would be no change in behaviors, related to depression. Mm. And there's Mm. been a huge change in behaviors related to depression that is in lockstep Mm. with those same reports of symptoms and clinical level Mm. um, symptoms. So emergency room admissions for self-harm, for suicide attempts, Mm. and completed suicides all have increased in a very, very similar pattern to depression. On that that point, is is it still? Uh, you'll know this. I, I won't know this off the top of my head. Is the the highest rate for suicide attempts uh, and maybe completions as well? Is it still forty five to fifty four? Am I am I is my data outdated on this? What's um, that? If we, it, I was actually just looking at that the other day. Um, it is now equalizing. So if you, is if it you really? It, yeah, it's really it's really interesting. You you it because yeah, that's what it used to be. It used to be middle right. age. Right. The suicide rate at least. For instance, I mean, this is recent. Since about 2018, this, the suicide rate for those in the, in their late 40s or early 50s has started to go down, uh-huh. and that for young adults has continued to go up. So they're 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 starting to equalize. Oh yikes! Ooh, that's yeah, very, that's very alarming. Yikes! Okay, yeah. okay. Um, see, well, see, like, see, this is this is why you're this is why you're in the weeds of the data. You got you got all you got it all love right the, there. Love the data. That's I love it. About. I love it. It's great though. It's great because I I like reading this stuff and and saying, well, what what are these other things? And so it's 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 great to really really kind of uh, talk it out. So one last thing here about on um, Gen Zs, and we'll move to millennials. Is so obviously uh, in the current moment is uh, a lot of you know, kind of challenging kind of gender norms that have been the case for a while. You talk about in your book. Um, And so there's a a tremendous increase. I think it's almost a million folks now identify as non-binary or, or it's, 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 what was it quadrupled within seven years? I mean, identifying as transgender quadrupled between 2014 and 21, 21 for young adults, only for young adults. Sure. Sure. What, what, I mean, that has to feel like, look, even if folks were, were not, you know, feeling uh, as comfortable to, to come out in, in certain ways of how they identify gender or, or what have you, um, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a tremendous increase in such a short amount of time. What, what can we make about this? What is some of the data showing us that say, what's going on here? Like, what's, what's up with this? Yeah. Yeah. So this, and this is, you know, this, this has changed so fast. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's it's absolutely you know still an emerging area of of research. So sure. you know, we're trying still trying to figure it out. I you know I'll say right up front I don't have all the answers here in terms of you know what exactly why and so on. You know I, I and everybody else you know really still still trying to figure that out. Um, but yeah, the, the the numbers are really stunning. I mean, for eighteen to twenty six year olds, twenty fourteen it was about um, a half of one percent. And that's a, that's a little factoid you hear a lot in transgender. It's a ha- about half of one percent. Not anymore. Um, it's two point four percent in seven years. In seven years, that's twenty in twenty twenty one. That's um, and then and then non-binary is even more. It's more. It's it's well depending on on when you're measuring it and you know how you look at it. Um, the most recent data I was able to find was fall twenty twenty two, and you know looking at say the youngest young adults. Like college age 18 to 22, it was more than 3% identifying as transgender and almost 5% identifying as non binary. Wow. Wow. So that these, you know, these are much bigger numbers than had been previously documented or believed. It is, again, I'm not trying to make something that's not there. So you tell me if I'm, I'm saying crazy stuff here, but is there any impact of social media and technology here as well of, of maybe not, not whether someone identifies that way, but whether they're, 
you know, um, uh, you know, kind of checking that box or listing that or being able to say, identify as this, you know, kind of this kind of public way of, of describing it or, or we don't know. We don't know. I mean, that, that's, that's one of the many really interesting questions that we have to answer. I mean, yeah. what, what, what I what can tell you is that if you look at, say, uh, again, the young adults identifying as transgender, that increase between 2014 and 2021, that large increase, is almost exactly the same in blue states, more liberal states, mm-hmm. and red, more conservative states. So, and that that surprised me. And I've heard a lot of people speculating on this. Oh, this is something that's much more happening in you know the big big liberal cities, mm-hmm. and it's not. It, this is this is happening nationally, not just regionally. Hmm. It's very interesting when you see numbers that big and they change in such a small time frame. They're again kind of like what you're saying. Again, I'm not I'm not trying to make an association, but kind of you're saying this 2012 with the kind of social media and all this stuff was like, well, what's happening here? Something's yeah. happening. And so yeah. it'll be very yeah. interesting to see, uh, you know, in the next couple of years, um, what's what, what 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 kind of hypotheses we can make about what's going on here. Uh, yeah, and, it's, and I think that's particularly true because that the, the um, change is just among young adults. So those over age about twenty seven, and especially those over the age of forty, mm-hmm. there was virtually no change in that mm-hmm. in that period among those uh, uh, for those identifying as transgender. Mm-hmm. So. That that's another thing we have to try to explain. Yeah, yeah, this is very fascinating. Okay, so let's let's talk about uh, my my cohort, <laughs> uh, 1980 and 94 millennials. Um, are we really narcissists? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> 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 I actually don't fit in like a millennial sometimes. Sometimes I do, but um but yeah, let's 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 talk about that. Yeah. So I know you've written about this stuff, narcissism, epidemic, all this stuff. I mean, are we really kind of self-absorbed and and it was it just <laughs> everyone's a winner mentality and you know, it's all, you know, uh, all these types of things. What is it about uh millennials na- millennials, excuse me, now is where, you know, kind of you know, in, in the business world, you know, kind of not the kind of newcomers on the on the scene. We're in managerial positions. Now we're, you know, all these things and we're in our 40s now. What do we make about all this stuff that, you know, Gen X and boomers used to make fun of millennials? Some of it was fair. Some of it maybe wasn't. But now as millennials are in their, you know, early 40s, what can we say about millennials and their major themes that they have? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I, we can absolutely document some trends in the culture during the millennials lifetime. Uh, like one of my favorite sources is Google books to look at, you know, words and phrases that are individualistic. Yeah. And there's just enormous changes in words like unique and identity and phrases like I am special, uh, you know, all of these things pretty much non-existent in America books up up until maybe the seventies and it starts to increase. And then during millennials lifetime, it just, it goes, goes right up. So we can see, you know, it's, so it's not just about one generation per se. It's that huge sea change in American culture toward more individualism. Mm -hmm. That's what I like about the Google books data. You know, it gets away from the question of individuals to say, you know, how did the culture change? And so we can see that. And then when we do look at individuals, you know, you know where this this start this started with boomers, um, and we, it's a little harder to to document the increase in self focus among boomers. We know the data that goes back as far, but it started to increase with my own generation, Gen Xers. This was my childhood too of uh, the self esteem boosting mm-hmm. and all about me and all of that. Um, you know, those of us born in the seventies experienced that as well, <laughs> and then it just kept going. So it kept going with millennials and it it kind of though that aspect anyway ended up peaking with millennials because with gen z as we were talking about with depression yeah. that means lower self-esteem right. less right. self-confidence mm. so it's like this this mountain and kind of maybe you started with boomers and gen xers and then millennials and then it went down so i think especially there's still that association with millennials because as it turned out the young people came after them were not all that certain of themselves mm-hmm. So, you know, the charitable way to think about it is the millennials are optimists, right? right. And then the uncharitable way is to say narcissism. Okay, well, that's where that's where it actually gets more complex, Mm -hmm. because if you look at stuff around like self-confidence, it absolutely peaked with millennials and then, you know, 
went down with Gen Z. Mm-hmm. But narcissism is more complex. Narcissism among college students, which is where we have the most data, yeah. went up from boomers to Gen Xers to millennials, but then peaked in about 2007 and then went down. Mm-hmm. So around the time of the Great Recession, maybe a reality mm-hmm. check. <laughs> and then you think, okay, well, then the economy comes back up. It should go back up. But I think it didn't because then there was that huge generational shift yeah. with Gen Z and then we get the low self-esteem and depression and, and you know, all, all of the stuff around technology and social media, just, you know, giving that generation much more, uh, less, less confidence in themselves and in, and in the world. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's a nice, that's a nice arc of which, of how you're describing it. Um, and I think that, I mean, that sounds right. I mean, obviously there, there's the data there, but that, I guess in, in terms of a narrative, that, I think that makes a lot of sense. I, so two things here. <clears throat> this was something that was really interesting. So I've, I've, I've been reading a little bit about the kind of social stuff, which I'll come to in a minute. But millennials are the most educated, but yes. higher ed seems to be falling out of favor. People are less enthused about it. Look, I mean, I I pay my my student loans that I'm still paying them back. And I think a lot of people realize this, like, you know, I mean, yes, we're educated, but, you know, paying the bill at the end of the day is like, ah, I mean, did I need to go $160,000 in student loan debt? So there's, there's some kind of evolution here. I think when I was younger, my folks and my grandparents all said, go to college, go to college, go to college, go to, that was the thing that was built, you know, just pushed into our heads. And now it seems like with, you know, kind of later millennials and then with the new generation, it's more of like, well, maybe, maybe not so much. I mean, obviously I'm going to promote a college degree, of course, but yeah, it's got negative news. You have the meritocracy thing, you have admissions issues, you have the student loans, you have, you know, all these different problems with higher ed, not to mention all the free speech stuff and campus issues and culture wars and People just now seem to be somewhat falling out of favor. So what, but what is that, how has that kind of, you know, kind of arc been for millennials, at least of being the most educated, but kind of dipping towards the end, there, falling out of favor. Yeah. So I, I think that a, a lot of that skepticism, so you know, there, there's, as you, as you mentioned, it's absolutely true. There's a lot of reasons, you know, for, for that skepticism around college and high education now, but I think a lot of it is the perception um, that millennials went to college more. That part is true. But the perception that millennials are broke, that they all went to college and they had all these loans and they still are driving cabs or, you know, just not using their degrees, you know, just any kind of job where maybe maybe you didn't even need to go to college. And that, you know, going to college maybe doesn't help you that much. And that millennials are all having to work side gigs and they're all poor and, you know, making a lot less money and accumulating a lot less wealth than previous generations. Turns out that's completely untrue. Yeah, not I wanted, I wanted to true, fight you on this. Yeah, yeah I was I was reading your book. I said, no, no, Gene, this is not true. This I worked three jobs. I was working. There's no way millennials made more money than all previous generations. And then yeah. I'm turning so the page my, and I'm my, turning my, the page. And not to be rude, but my answer to that is take it up with the Census Bureau. <laughs> right, right, right. You know? <laughs> so wait, so explain this. Okay. Yeah. I, if you were to tell any millennial this, they'll have the same response I initially right. did. So oh, I know. I realize how did, that. How, how did we make more money than all previous generations? How did we do better with home ownership? How does this map on the well, income not, and not wealth? Not better, but not as bad as commonly believed with home ownership. Yeah. Sure. But but if, if we were better at income, wealth, what's the what's the What's yeah. the narrative here? How did this happen yeah. for us? Because we don't feel it. Yeah. Because more millennials went to college. That's so, a, that's the the shortest explanation. That's the correlation. Why. And because more women went to college uh-huh. and entered careers and started making more money, that's where almost all of the gains come is from mm. women. Mm. So female millennials just so outpace the, yeah. the uh, salaries of previous generations. It's just incredible, mm-hmm. and that's that's why. And then and you know and you know what I was joking, but not joking about is, yeah, these numbers come from the Census Bureau, Mm -hmm. from uh, median household income, median personal income among 25 to 44 year olds. It's at all time highs. It's higher than when Gen Xers and boomers were the same age. And yes, I know it doesn't feel that way. (laughs) And I think there are reasons why it doesn't feel that way. Um, One, one is for, you know, if you're going to have kids and you're in a heterosexual couple, then you have to pay for childcare if you're not going to lose the woman's income. 
income, which is now much a much higher uh, proportion of families' um, resources than it used to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, w- once I kept reading towards the end of the chapter, I was I was kind of convinced. I just I wanted to resist that because we're supposed to be perpetually broke for the, all of our, <laughs> of our life. But I guess I guess the other thing here was um, about with with working is I w- at first I would have thought well. I heard so many stories about people would, they went to college and then 08 happened and then 09. And then you had the great recession and then inflation, all these things. So even with that, it was still okay for millennials. Yeah. And, you know, it is absolutely true that this, this graph I'm looking at right now, that's also in the the excerpt of the book that's in the Atlantic Mm -hmm. uh, has this graph in it as well. Um, Yeah. Median household incomes for those age groups took a huge hit during the great recession, but they roared back and they roared back. So that the, the highs are higher than ever. Mm. Yeah. That's, it's incredible. And, and so now, I mean, so there was all the other issues. So, okay. More educated, we're doing better economically and, 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 and such, but things socially seem to kind of turn again, not dramatically, but again, millennials aren't having as much sex and not sexually active currently, I believe they're waiting longer or I should say older, you know, until they're older to get married yep. and longer to have kids. If any at all, you don't see many millennial households with six kids. I mean, it's, right. it's one, maybe two. Is that a, an economic kind of thing of like, as you said, childcare is, you know, I mean, it's, it's very expensive. Uh, they don't feel as, you know, family, you know, one of the things about, you know, people being you know separated and, and connected through digital means is that not everyone lives in the same town or city. What are some of the reasons for some of these kind of relational differences with millennials? You know, it really doesn't look like it is economics, even though you know the child care piece is, is big and we and we have to consider that. But some of these things don't go the direction that people expect. Mm-hmm. Um people who make less money have more children, have on, on average, um, there's been some studies by some economists on uh, the declining birth rate, and they found that the birth rate declined the most among among the in the counties where that were doing the best economically. Mm. So it really doesn't seem like that's the biggest thing. And and actually, there's also surveys of young adults about you know, do you want to have children? If not, why? And generally speaking, the number one reason of those is is personal freedom that's what comes up the most consistently mm-hmm. and so that's individualism yeah yeah it's yeah. not the economic piece that's yeah. individualism and that you know and it, it it is important to put it in context of say oh, oh it's just it's just millennials well it's individualism and the slow life strategy right. and the birth rate has actually been going down for a, a while mm-hmm. um the baby boom was just this huge anomaly mm-hmm. and it is important to put it in context um, but I, I also think the general narrative of millennials aren't having kids because they're broke just isn't true. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's important because again, people get these kind of, you know, tropes that kind of get shared and, and then it's like, is that really what that is? Or is it something else? I guess the last question is kind of a sort of a comparison is, um, millennials care a lot about social causes, but that doesn't always translate to being involved in politics is, is you, I think you mentioned this as well. Is that? I feel like that's a sort of a a change with Gen Z's because I I feel like the way millennials care about social causes and issues is different than how Gen Z's care about them, right? And and so, what what difference have you observed? Well, okay, I'll give you. I'll give you. I mean, it's all anecdotal, but one of the things I notice with Gen Z's is that I, I guess millennials talk a big game, and they and they like to signal a lot. They like to signal a lot of like, this is what I'm for, and. And here's the, you know, people don't put bumper stickers, but here's the whatever on social media, you know, what causes and yeah, I give, you know, whatever to to Greenpeace or whatever. But for Gen Z's, it really is a way of living for them. They really care about fairness and justice with their friends, with other people, um, you know, very, very concerned about the welfare of others, even if they don't know them, but this, especially if they do know them, I find Gen Z's very interesting because they, in some ways, seem very inward, um, but also not like in a in a in a in a in a negative way. I mean it just in a way of very 
surveying the kind of landscape before kind of jumping into it with a lot of over <laughs> indulgent optimism and we're going to change the world and all these things. I think they, they, they kind of live it. They kind of really do live it. Whereas I find uh, my generation, I'll pick them. It's my generation. So I'll pick on them is it's, it's a lot of big talk. It's a lot of like, yeah, this is what I'm for. And let me let you know what I'm really caring about. And let me signal this to you. And let me tell you this, but when push comes to shove, ah, I don't really, I mean, Maybe a little, but I'm not going to live it all the time, you know, but that's my, again, this is just my behavior observations. Um, but, but what are your thoughts, I guess, about how millennials care about social issues, but it doesn't always translate into action necessarily. And I see that a little bit different with Gen Z is actually more positive for Gen Z's. What, what do you make of this? Yeah, I, th- I, I think there, there's, there's some data to back up. Um, you know, some of what you're talking about. So like in the survey data, there's been a big increase among uh, teens and college students in the percentage who say um, helping others in difficulty is important. There's been a huge increase in voter turnout among young adults since it transitioned to Gen Z. Uh, There's a lot of negativity and dissatisfaction in Gen Z. And if they channel that into politics, which seems like they are, we'll have to see. Mm -hmm. And that might be the case. Um, so, you know, it's it's interesting with millennials because I think I think if you if you had asked me 15 years ago, you know, is it is it all just a big talk? I would have said, I hate to say it, but yeah. <laughs> but I think that is that not as I don't believe that quite as much now. Just given um, if you look at say the number of millennials uh, being elected to the House of Representatives, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. outpaces Gen X, even if you correct for population, voter mm-hmm. turnout you're better than Gen X uh, at the at the younger ages. So, and that, and I, that also didn't used to be true um, because as teens, millennials are like, eh, you know, when it came to a lot of stuff around political yeah. um, participation and the teen data, it's it didn't look any better than Gen Xers or Boomers, and in many cases, it looked worse. Mm-hmm. But as millennials have gotten into uh, their um, late twenties to to early forties. You know, recently, some of that has turned around a little bit. Mm, interesting. Yeah, it's, inter- it's interesting seeing how generations get older. It's, it's very interesting. Yeah. So, so let's let's talk about Gen X. Uh, this is this is where you 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 fit in personally. It's uh, 1965 to 1979. Um, so. You guys, as you say, are you're the middle child, literally the middle child of generations. We are, it's, it's, we are the middle <laughs> child of generations. Yeah, in every a, way. Yeah, technology, individualism, the slow life, and uh, getting strategy. ignored, and, and getting <laughs> people forget about about Gen X. So I'm gonna I'm gonna introduce uh, uh, somebody that I'm I'm uh, very friendly with. She's been on my podcast. Uh, she's great, Megan Dom. You mentioned her many times in the book. Yes, uh, she's yes. lovely. She's wonderful. Uh, folks should listen to her podcast. It's great. Um, and we talked about this when she was she was on here about, about folks in her generation, Gen X, they kind of wore with pride this idea. This is her hypothesis, this idea of having toughness, of of grit, toughness, a thick skin, you know, whereas generations after, less so. <laughs> um, what do you think about the way she conceptualizes, you know, kind of Gen X generally of this kind of toughness, thick skin, and kind of wearing that with like pride or, or honor? What, what, are, what are your thoughts on that? I, I think it's a very useful paradigm mm-hmm. for trying to understand Gen X. Um, I think it's it's also a, a useful paradigm for trying to wrap your mind around some of the free speech issues and campus controversies and political controversies um, of, of the last five to 10 years. Mm. Uh, I, as, as I was thinking about some of those issues and looking at, you know, both the survey data and, you know, lots of, of news stories that kind of came up over and over that that's where the, the generational break seems to be mm. around a lot of these free speech issues is between Gen X and Millennials, mm. even though you know Gen X is not supposed to like Boomers. Um, we don't, most of us. But <laughs> just kidding. But or maybe not. But there, but but that there is that division um, when it comes to those issues that uh, really much more you know Gen X and, and Boomers are behind the idea of let's have the discussion, let's have the speaker come to campus, even if he or she is controversial, and more speech, that more speech is better. And I think that is partially based in that toughness idea Mm. of 
were um, not going to fall apart if we had that discussion uh, with somebody that we disagree with. And that is just not val as valued um, on average anyway, among millennials and Gen Z. And what Megan Dawn makes the case for, and I, I don't want to misstate her argument, but that, I mean, she makes the case that it's it's actually the opposite, that a lot of millennials and Gen Z, in fact, value not being tough. Oh, yeah. No, they don't. Yeah. No, no. I mean, yeah, I mean, again, that's, 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 that's a generalization, but and, but and I can see that viewpoint, and I'm not, you know, I don't want to take too hard a position on this because it is true that may you can take that argument about we need to be tough way too far. Sure, I, sure, I sure. absolutely agree that that's true. Yeah, um, yeah. and that more sensitivity to, like, I mean, just as one example, mental health issues is fantastic. Of course. Yeah, um, yeah. but a lot of the clashes that have occurred, um, on campuses, um. Newspapers, you know, lots and lots of examples around cancel culture and these things. So that's how the, the generations have broken down, mm. um, and it has very often been, uh, you know, the Gen Xer who says, "Let's publish the op-ed with the controversial mm. argument," and it's been the millennial and Gen Z, mostly millennial employees, who have said, mm -hmm. "No, we mm -hmm. we can't do this," and then you know, get, and let's get somebody fired. Right. This is where I don't fit in with millennials. Cause I, I find that really frustrating, <laughs> but, but maybe it's just temperament or because I was raised by a few, uh, my parents are, are old, uh, Gen X. Um, so I guess, um, you talk about this long adolescence for Gen X, which I thought was really fascinating the way you, you, you framed it, the, the long adolescence with a, a faster life strategy early and then yep. a slower one as adults. Well, talk about this. This is really interesting. Yeah. yeah. You know, so the the trajectory for the slow life um, is fairly linear for for most of the generations, you know, from childhood to adolescence to, to young adulthood, except for Gen X. That if you look at the other generations, like everything kind of slowed down. But for Gen X, there's this weird time, you know, especially like early 90s, when it was, you know, big increase in the teen pregnancy rate, you know, babies having babies, yep. huge increase in, in the violent crime rate, um, more, you know, lots of uh, uh, younger um, teens having sex than had previously been the case. And, you know, I was a teen at this time, and the, I think the, the fear was this was going to go on forever, and it didn't. It ended up reversing, you know, to, to some extent with millennials. Right. So, um Gen X had this, just this, you know, their, their childhood was shortened because there was the kind of this reality, uh, uh, kind of smacking kids in the face around, the, you know, some of the, the, the toughness mm -hmm. uh, and the grittiness of, you know, that early 1990s time where kids kind of grew up fast. Mm -hmm. But then Gen X also continued that trend of marrying later having their kids later, um, settling into careers later. So yeah, I am proud to say that um, my Gen X generation, my generation had the longest adolescence of, of any generation. You know, we were snotty teenagers for the longest. <laughs> but see, this is, this is what makes you guys so cool because you guys are still kind of tethered to like young people, I think. You know, it's like, you know, again, my parents are on the, the very, they're kind of on the cusp there. Of boomers and gen x and so i mean they're still they're young and you know they're still they're still cool they still you know they got some weird ideas on some things but they're cool like they're <laughs> they're, they're cool to hang out with you know i mean that's you know i, I mean i i, I think that that's i, yeah, I it they're, made they're, sense they're, with still, that. they're still wearing their nirvana t-shirt yeah well that's the thing now uh, that's the thing now everyone wears you know all the gen z's yeah, are wearing nirvana right. t-shirts <laughs> yeah um and the other thing here with with uh with gen x is that you you it's interesting. You talk about Gen X having one foot in the older world and one foot yeah. in, in the newer technological world. They're kind of, again, right? <laughs> right in the middle. But, you know, you talk about, you know, basically Gen X growing up on TV, like as like they were the ones growing up on TV, which is, which is uh, really, really interesting to think about. Uh, much like how, I guess, Gen Z grow, grows up on, on, on online. But you talk about how Gen X was the first generation to, to really kind of start to see this erosion of trust in institutions. So obviously, we've been talking a lot about that 
uh, uh, culturally in our society about people don't trust any institutions anymore. And, and obviously, again, uh, online and has been tough for that. But what, why? Why did yeah. Gen X start saying, well, wait a minute, we, we don't need, you know, the, this institution? Was it this just this rebellious kind of nature or what was it about that? Yeah, yeah, that's what that's what you see, and I mean, and this this is one of those trends that it, it's important to put it in the context that decline in trust and and the decline in um, confidence and trust in institutions has affected all of the generations, and that's a change that's fairly linear. Hmm. So, I, I put it in the Gen X chapter because that kind of accelerated um, when Gen Xers were uh, teens and young adults during that formative period. So I, I don't think it is just, you know, Gen X cynicism or something like that, because mm-hmm. it was starting with the boomers. It continued with millennials who are otherwise much more optimistic generation, you know, and it's continued with 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 Gen Z. Um, so I, I think it's much more around those big cultural trends, um, things like individualism of, you know, if you're going to focus more on yourself, then what do you need these institutions for? What do they know? Yeah. And then also technology in various forms. So um, with Gen X, it might have been, um, for example, just the, the the overall, What and I don't think this is 100% bad, but what many people would call the deterioration of the media landscape, mm. that, you know, when you had three channels, well, that wasn't great for many reasons, first of all, boredom, <laughs> but it was more trusted. Mm. But then when it became infotainment, which it started to do right. when Gen Xers were young. And then you had to much more compete for ratings with news, with cable television. Mm-hmm. And then the internet took it next level. Uh, yeah, you might have a newspaper subscription. That's how the, how the newspaper makes the money. But then it became individual stories. Mm-hmm. And what gets clicks? Mm-hmm. Negativity, anger, cynicism distrust, you know, all of that stuff. Um, so it just kind of, you know, kept kept going in that direction where, I mean, I think you just, you lose a lot of credibility mm. when what you're writing for is clicks and entertainment yeah. instead of the number one goal being truth. I mean, I'm, I don't know how else to put it, but I, yeah. I fully agree with you. I mean, <clears throat> the thing that I've been, the, the, the drum I've been beating is we don't need to you know, kind of do everything on, you know, Substack uh, or on podcast or that's great, but we can't just build our own institutions in this kind of individual kind of like, you know, bubbles. We we have to reform institutions, but they have to modernize as well. And I, I think part of the problem is, is, is somewhat of it is audience capture and what gets clicks and stuff. And it's like, well, how do we, how do we still, you know, aspire for the truth, if you will, I'll use that loosely. Where, you know, we're not, you know, where we can still trust institutions. How do they reform? How do we, you know, how do we modernize them? And, you know, so I'm a big believer in that. But, you know, it's it sounds like there's been some of that with boomers, you know, really pushes with Gen X. And then now it's, you know, it's 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 on steroids now at the moment. So it's it's really, you know, it's a big problem, obviously. So, um, OK, boomers. So boomers. 46 to 64. Um, <laughs> so it's very interesting. Are, are boomers like the older millennials of sorts? Because boomers, are, you talk about, were centered for much of their life. So in the 50s and 60s, things were child focused. In the 70s, it was all about the mystical. In the 80s and 90s, building careers and family. 2000s, finding meaning. Like, why? Why have boomers just kind of been the centerpiece? Again, that's not a knock on boomers. I'm, I'm not. I'm not doing that. But why? What is it about <laughs> as American life in the 20th, 20th century and the 21st century has has progressed? It's just very boomer centered. Is how did that happen? I guess. I mean, maybe it just kind of happened. But what do you think is 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 there? Because there are so many of them. <laughs> And that, I mean, that's where they get their name from, from the baby boom. Um, So, you know, at the beginning of that chapter, uh, I I, I did my own version of a graph I remember seeing decades ago. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sometimes some people call it the pig and the python, Mm -hmm. that there's just, there were these just enormous number of babies born between the end of World War II and the early 60s. And if you just look at the, at the population, 
you graph it in a certain way, you can see that they they dominated childhood. You know, there's so many of them, and then they just you know they then move through the life cycle, mm -hmm. and they have dominated every stage of the life cycle, um, just because of, of sheer size. Mm -hmm. And and interestingly enough, their individualism started to become a, a kind of key component. You talk about how self-expression, self-confidence, using words like unique and identity start to become important. And, and some of that has implications of, well, if you have more individuality, more autonomy, there's some good stuff, but that this kind of drove up some of the increases in divorce rates at this time too. Is, is, is What do we make about this, I guess, the pros and cons of boomers starting to become more individualized and autonomous? Yeah. I mean, every cultural system is a trade-off and individualism is no different. You get more freedom, but more disconnection. And that I, I think that's a pretty good summary of, of boomers, although admittedly, this is a, a trend that's impacted all of the generations. And one of the things that we see here for boomers is that there was an increase in mental health challenges with boomers. And you talk about yes. these deaths of despair, which was this is really troubling to read some of the data on here. What what was connected to this? If, if stuff for a lot of people, not everybody, but was going well in, in the 50s and 60s. And, you know, again, there's obviously big, 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 big life uh, or cultural events that were happening. Civil rights, um, ec economics weren't great in the 70s, um, you know, so on and so forth. But was this all part of it? Like, you know, obviously economically, the country in the United States was doing okay. But what was it about uh, this increase in mental health and, and deaths of despair for boomers? Yeah. So um, this is uh, started with um, Case and Deaton, the economists, showing this a few years ago that they found there was this just huge increase in death rates um, among, say, 55 to 64-year-olds. Mm. Uh, and you know, that started, I'm, I'm looking at the, the graph here, around 2000 or so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, things uh, where it started to not look good. And then, because what you expect, of course, is with more medical advances, mm -hmm. that death rates are going to just keep going down. Yeah. And then they didn't. And what Case and Deaton found was that was that was true um, only for for white Americans. And since about 2016 or 2017, it's actually been true across all mm. groups. We group everybody together. It's not just uh, white Americans. We start to see this increase in death rates. And it's I mean, it's stark, you know, drug overdoses in particular, mm -hmm. often opioids, yeah. suicide, liver disease. You know, I have a, a chart in here comparing the silent generation in 2000 when they were the 55 to 64 year olds versus the boomers in 2019. So pre COVID mm -hmm. and boomers have a higher death rate from all three of those. And those are, those are the deaths of despair. Um, so even, even though, you know, deaths from heart disease and cancer and all these things, we have, you know, better treatments for than we did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. There's all of these things that are more psychologically related that have gotten a lot worse. What do you think is the ripple effect of that for Gen X, Millennial, Gen Z, where you having grandparents or parents, et cetera, that are uh, really in a tough spot? And in some cases, you know, there's there's suicide attempts and or you know completions, if you will. What's the what do we think is the ripple effect of that for for other generations? As well, that's an option, or someone else in my family did it, or. Well, when you get really, you know, again, things change, but what's the ripple effect, I guess? Yeah. And I mean, I think, I think that that's a good question. I, I, I wasn't really able to, to look at that, you know, with, with the data I was able to, to work with, but, it, you know, you can, you can definitely um, make the observation that with boomers being the, the, you know, the, the generation um, in their you know, right before retirement in this time when they're leading the country and often, you know, the people who are um, kind of most prominent in a lot of organizations and you got all these problems. Mm -hmm. It's, it's clear that this idea that the boomers are all rich and powerful and doing great isn't true. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very, it's very interesting with, with boomers. I, I, I think they're, they're very interesting uh, cohort. Um, and obviously still having certain certain challenges even even in older age. 
okay so the last the last group uh that you discuss um silence 1925 to 1945 okay this blew my mind blew my mind when i read this i still can't really get over it that joe biden is the first and probably last u.s president from the silent generation how did that happen how did we just get all boomers it, we, we we did greatest and boomers like that's that's what we did for presidents and i mean it's just a fun fact but i mean everyone talks about biden's age and all this stuff of course but like he had to wait until 78 to even get there. It's not like we had all these other silent uh, presidents. So this kind of goes to the whole theme that they're, they actually get credit or should, or excuse me, should get credit for a lot of the social change because they were in their twenties and thirties for civil rights, gay rights, feminist movement, you know, yep. all the stuff we associate yep. with boomers right. really are silence that were adults in that period and they're the in-between between greatest and, and boomers. So we don't talk, again, true to the name, we don't talk, we kind of forget about silence, but what do we make about silence and how, and how they are and how they have been kind of behind the scenes in our society for, right. for 100 years? What do, what right. do you make of so, I mean, of, of all the generational names, silent generation is the biggest misnomer. Because <laughs> you, if you look at the civil rights movement, the mm -hmm. feminist movement, the gay rights movement, they were led by silent members. Yeah. yeah That's yeah. who led those those movements. Uh, and they were a lot of the, you know, so-called foot soldiers in those movements as well. Um, and the two most famous silents, arguably, Martin Luther King Jr., Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah, it's wild. But think about that. Think about those two people. Yeah. And the effect that they that they had and what they symbolize yeah. in terms of the change in our society when it mm -hmm. comes to race and, and gender. Yeah. And, you know, right there, you can see that they were not silent. <laughs> no, no. But it, it's it's again, it's so interesting. I don't know. You, you, you mentioned something that I thought was really for me is really admirable to kind of conceptualize it this way of that they're seen as a kind of in between on many social cultural issues. And that they bridge gaps and that they have, they're one of the last, I don't want to say that they're, that nobody else does this, but they're one of the last in terms of a generation or cohort to have a strong bipartisan culture. What are the values underlying that? And where did that go? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially these days, you know, silent, they're, they're the last of the old school. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're the last of, you know, because they, they grew up, you know, before everything changed. You know, boomers grew up kind of during time when everything was changing. Right. And silence grew up before that. Mm -hmm. So for for them, it's it's just a it's a totally different world. Um you know, like one uh one one thing that I I wasn't able to do a ton of interviews for this book just given that it was on six generations. Right. Uh but I did interview a silent generation member um who grew up in the segregated South. Mm. And so he's black and he went to a segregated school and he couldn't go to the swimming pool on the town. And when he went to the movies, he and his friends sat, sat in the balcony mm. and he gives presentations at like high schools and so on and basically blows everybody's mind. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a Gen Xer and, and I, I, you know, Obviously, I've read a ton of history and so on, but hearing that personal experience is just it's it it feels unbelievable. Yeah. In in a way, you know, when you're younger and then you you, you feel that and then you're like, okay, come on, stop being stupid. This really ha you know, this this is this is this isn't just history. Here right. these people lived it. He lived yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. That stuff always blows my mind. I mean, I, I obviously have talked to folks as well that have lived that. And it's that feels like so long ago, but it really wasn't. The fact that there's people still alive, like that was their childhood or that was their adolescence. Like, yeah, wow. Like, you know, and for many of the other generations, you know, after mine, that is a you know, history books. I mean, that is very much yeah. like that's old right. history for them. But like right. it's just it is wild to think that like it wasn't that long ago, which is I mean, incredible in a negative and a positive way. It's just, it yeah. just is like, you know, wow. And like, you know, when you think about pre-World War One, right? I mean, 
growing up, you know, pre, you know, during, you know, as you know, right after the the Great Depression, 29 or whatever. So people born in 25 or 26, you know, being kids, you know, having some vague recollections of that. I mean, that's so interesting, you know, that and again, how <laughs> they're silent, but not really. They're just really influential, like you were giving the examples. And many people, I mean, again, people give a lot of grief to to you know how old Congress is, but a lot of people in Congress are silent. I think you, I think you mentioned uh, Nancy Pelosi, obviously Joe Biden, Steny Hoyer, um, Mitch McConnell, I believe. You know, there's a lot of folks in in government uh, or have been that or that kind of what you're saying, that kind of binding together, that trying to keep the glue and and all of these things. And so uh, it is it is interesting how how much we can. Uh, kind of still learn for, from that generation as they're, they're still around. So, okay. So I, I guess the, 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 the last question here, um, as we've, as we've gone through all the six, I guess one question before I ask my last one is, did you consider or want to do greatest generation or, or, cause you know, that was, you know, for a long time, you obviously remember folks from greatest generation. I remember people from greatest generation, even though they're not really around that much anymore. Did you consider kind of lumping them in there or, or no? You know, I, I didn't. And I think it was just because when I looked at the big data sets I work with, silence was the first time you could even get a partial. Mm-hmm. I mean, you, there's a little bit on greatest because, say, the general social survey, one of the things I draw from started in 1972. And so, if you, you know, you could get some of the greatest in there, but that's kind of about, you know, there's just not mm-hmm. as much. You know, a lot of the other surveys didn't get, get going until the 90s. Mm-hmm. So, there's just not, it, it'd be very hard. Yeah, to try yeah. to do, and that that's what I'm all about, you know, this is yeah. 20, 24 data sets, 39 million people. Yeah. Um, I've, I've lost track of the number. It's almost 200 graphs. So, uh, wow. yeah. It's, it's, it's a, there's definitely a lot of graphs, but uh, I, I do love it. Okay, so the last question I have is, what, where, what do future generations um, see in their, I guess, evolution? Are we going to see a small narrowing of time between generations? Right. So even like with the one where we started with the, with the polars, as you say, you know, the, 2013, but you know, is it going to get smaller as the world keeps changing faster and faster, or is it just going to kind of balance out? So how do we continue to do this research or this data um, for, for future generations? And, and what, what do we see in the concept of generations as we continue moving in a, a digital age? Yeah. And we'll have to see. I mean, it, I think that, trying to figure out, say, the the end point for polars, that will evolve. And mm-hmm. we'll see, you know, how things how things go. I think the, the, the good news is, yes, the generational groupings are, are are useful, but we can study how things change over time without using them at all. Mm-hmm. So no matter what the generational groupings end up looking like, we can study cultural change. We can see how young people are different in any particular year compared to the past, no matter what the groupings end up being. Yeah. And finally, you've written uh, such a great book and there's a lot of data, a lot of graphs, a lot of charts, uh, really good stuff. Um, What is it that you want people to kind of walk away with? They read this book and what is that one or two things where you're like, yeah, that's it. That's what I was trying to say. You got it. What do you want people, I guess, to really walk away from, from all the hard work you've done in this book? Yeah. Great question. I will choose two. Okay. Um, One is I think we, really have to move away from this model of the generational conflict mm. of, oh, it's the boomer's fault. Mm. Who are we going to blame for this? Why are you blaming millennials for, for this? We have big cultural changes. All of us are participating in them. Mm. Let's try to step away from the, from the finger pointing and try to work together toward solutions and also recognize not all change is negative. Yeah. You know? Are we going to, you know, blame boomers for the good stuff too? You know, I think that's kind of a, a, a funny discussion that some some of it's good, some of it's bad. There's trade-offs. Every time has its challenges mm-hmm. because really my number one goal in this book was for us to try to understand each other better. Yeah. That's yeah. really the key. You know, that's yeah. the point of of all of the data and the graphs and the analysis and the the interviews and the examples is to try to understand each other better. So that's that's really the the, the first the first piece. Um, let's learn about other generations. Try to see things from their perspective. Mm. It's very very useful. And the second piece is to consider and maybe reconsider the the role of technology in our lives. That technology has 
given us longer lives. Technology has given us more time in our day that we don't have to spend on survival. What are we going to do with that time? Are we going to sit around watching TikTok videos? Scrolling through Instagram, arguing with people on Twitter? Maybe for an hour. But use that precious time for something that will have meaning, Mm. that will make you happy. Mm. Just think about it. Mm. And it is easier said than done. (laughs) You know, these are the algorithms on social media are designed to keep us coming back. (laughs) But I think almost everybody living now can identify with that, that we have to rest to that time back. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and give it to ourselves mm-hmm. yeah I, I i completely agree uh well the book is called generations uh the real differences uh between gen z millennials gen x boomers and silence and what they mean for america's future and it's uh fantastic um where can uh people find yourself i mean this book is out everywhere where can uh this is through simon and schuster where where can people find you or the best places to uh to connect with you or, or anything else yeah um, so I have a, a website, so it's genetwangy.com. So J E A N T W E N G E.com. So I've got stuff on the book, stuff on speaking engagements. Um, I have a frequently asked questions about generations on there. Um, and the only social media I have is Twitter. <laughs> I'm the last uh, person of my generation who's never had a Facebook page. Um, and I try to, to, but you know, social media has its uses, and one of them is exchanging ideas with mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. and making those connections. It does, it does have some benefits. So um, just try not to get sucked in yeah, that, me and everybody right. else. We try not to get sucked in. <laughs> that's, that's right. <laughs> Hard that's to right. do. <laughs> well, Gene, this really absolute joy and a delight uh, to talk with you. I feel very enriched. Um, I loved your book. I loved reading it. Um, very, very, very useful, very helpful, very readable for everybody. And it was uh, a real, privilege and honor to talk with you for an hour and a half about all of these important things so i can't say enough thanks really thank you oh well thank you thank you for for all of your questions and a great discussion i really enjoyed it absolutely